Good morning everybody, it is so good to be with you today and I'd just like to welcome everybody and I hope that you enjoy the service with us today. First of all, we want to just um, share our heartfelt deepest condolences to Sabrina and Celine and the family for the loss of Roland. He's absent in the body but he's present with the Lord and we thank the Lord for that. And today, because we have an online service, you can sit in your jammies or you can sit um, with a blanket around you and you can stay warm and you can actually sit and enjoy the service in the comfort of your own home. But please don't forget to like us and share us across Facebook. And remember, we're going to put it on YouTube. And I thank Yaku for being on the other end um, of admin. And for always, everyone assisting us, we are really, truly blessed to be part of such an amazing family. Now, let's close our eyes and let's just pray, open in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this amazing opportunity to still minister your word, to share the gospel. And Father, we just thank you that, that you are king, that you are God, and that you are love. We thank you, Lord, that anything that, that um, tries to to hinder us, Lord God, we can just stand and say, but our God, our God is awesome, he's wonderful, merciful, graceful, and he will make a way. And I thank you, Father God, for protecting our people, protecting your people, Father God, and loving on them, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Now, Pastor Jay has got a very interesting message for us today. And I'm going to leave it for him to explain and to... Um, bring the word to you so enjoy until we see you again soon love you lots Jack. Um, good morning everyone thank you for joining us today uh, I believe that you are ready if you can say this wherever you are say I am ready for the word of God we've got a few uh, members sitting here and so it feels a little bit uh, like church. It's not as if I'm just speaking to the camera and I thank God for that. Let's just open up in prayer and I want you to really open your heart, your mind and uh, pray with me. Be in agreement with me as we pray this morning over the word that will go out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a merciful and a gracious God. We thank you Lord that we can come to you with boldness knowing that you love us that you have our best interest at heart and Lord that you looking for opportunity to bless us and to be merciful to us and to be gracious to us and I pray for everyone Lord listening this morning that they as they come boldly before the throne of grace that they will obtain that mercy and that grace that they need in their time of need we thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said Amen. amen, amen and amen. Again, we want to extend our condolences to um, Sabrina with the passing of, of Roland. Um, we had the opportunity not too long ago to sit here with, with him in our home and, and talk about the Lord and about healing. And I can say one thing that he said, I will not let go of the Lord. And I know that he's saved. I know that he belongs to the Lord and he is with the Lord at the moment and so um, if Jesus does not come in our lifetime that's that's the road we're all going to go we all, it's destined for man wants to die the Bible says and after that the judgment but the title of my message this morning is the great mercy of God I want you to know and understand when you go from this uh, broadcast that God is a merciful God God is great in mercy and there's two scriptures that I want us to read one in the Old Testament and one in the New and the Old Testament scripture that I want us to look at is Psalm 145 verse 8 it says the Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and great in mercy now there's a whole lot that he says there God is gracious God never changes and so he's always grace gracious towards us from eternity he is a gracious God and he's full of compassion 
You know, there's not one that I know that has the compassion that God has towards his creation. And God has that uh, that compassion towards you. God feels it towards you every single day. And then he's slow to anger. You can't get God angry very quickly. He's slow to anger. And the reason why he's slow to anger is because of his great love. Because he wants repentance. He wants people to repent and turn to him. And so it takes a lot to make God angry. And uh, then he's great in mercy. Great in mercy. Ephesians 2 verse 4 in the New Testament says, But God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with, with which he loved us. You see, he's rich in mercy, great in mercy, because of his love. Remember the scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everything that God does towards us, everything that moves him to act on our behalf is love that is behind it. God's love is so great and therefore his mercy towards us is motivated by his great love and i want you to understand today that god is gracious and god will show great mercy to you now many are afraid today as they see the nearness of the coming of the lord jesus it is evident in the world today that the scene is perfectly set for the war that's described in ezekiel 38 to 40. Uh, many refer to that as the great war the, th the third world war the, the war of Gog and Magog, uh, the war of Armageddon. Uh, and, and we see how that the nations are beginning uh, to gather against Israel. All the nations bordering Israel, which is also known as the Ring of Fire. Uh, uh, and, and, and that, that uh, uh, war will be led by Russia. And we see how that, how that Syria... Uh, is getting into the picture and Russia is moving uh, their, their airplanes, their warplanes to, to Syria. And, and it's very evident, if you know a little bit about uh, the, the politics of today and uh, the prof uh, prophetic word uh, in the Old Testament, that the nations are getting ready for a war against Israel. Now, I'm saying all of this to, to, to say that as Christians are looking at this, they become aware of the fact that the return of Jesus Christ is very soon. And it makes many in the church or the Christian world aware that there is no more time for us. The, the, the time of the age of grace, the dispensation of grace has come to an end. Now, believe me, Jesus is coming. Whether you are ready for it or not, whether you believe it or not, because in God's timetable, there's a set time. God has set times in which he does things. And uh, in his set time, Jesus is coming. Uh, and there's nothing that you and I can do to uh, prolong it or to cancel it. All of the prayer uh, that we can do all of the fasting will not change that set time he's coming at that set time and jesus himself promised in the book of john 14 verse 1 to 3 that he is coming back and he will receive us so that we can be where he is that's the promise of jesus that he's coming back and the nearness of his coming can be seen all around us. There can be no doubt. Even the nominal Christian, even the backslidden Christian can see that Jesus uh, and his coming is around the corner. Unbelievers in the world, just looking at the political uh, arena, are agreeing that something is coming and that this looks like the end of the age, the end of time as we know it. Now, all of this awareness all over means... That the nearness of Jesus, in many cases, the nearness of his coming, makes Christians afraid. And I want to specifically minister to believers, to Christians this morning. And they, they become fearful because they are still walking under the shame, under the guilt, and under the condemnation of their sin. Some of them are struggling with certain sins and weaknesses, if you want to call it that way. And uh, they are afraid of the coming of the Lord because they feel that they are not ready to meet the Lord. Now, Satan is still succeeding in keeping Christians 
from the wonderful liberty that is in the word of God. Many do not know the scriptures that deals with his grace and his mercy uh, and, and, and his love for us. Now I want us to just look at that word mercy again. In the Strong's it says it is to stoop down in kindness to an inferior. It is to favor. It is to grant or to give something that is normally not deserved. And, and God has been so merciful to us. He has left heaven. He's come down to earth. And he has uh, paid for our sins on the cross. He suffered a horrific death. A death of a criminal. Just so that he can show us mercy. That which we did not deserve. So much he loved us. And many are not... Uh, mindful of that, not mindful of the greatness of the grace of God. And therefore they are fearful when they are thinking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to use uh, a, a, a few examples in the scripture later on that will just paint the picture because I want you to focus again on the mercy of God. I want that picture to be painted of how willing God is to forgive and to restore you who have fallen. Many Christians have fallen. Many have fallen into sin. Many are struggling to get out of sin. And uh, unfortunately, the church at large are heaping condemnation and guilt on those who have fallen. It's like someone says, you know, the church is the only army that shoots its own wounded, that uh, kills its own wounded. And uh, I think by and large, the church does not know how to handle people who has fallen into sin. And I'm talking to great, uh, a gross sin. Um, but I want you to understand that he loves you. And if you've fallen, God's love for you has not changed. If there's a desire in your heart to serve him, then I want you to know he's not given up on you. If you are feeling convicted about any sin, of, about any habit that you are doing, then I want you to know it is a sign that he has not given up on you. And the Holy Spirit is busy working, trying uh, to get your cooperation. And if you give your cooperation, he will get you out of that sin and so but much more i want you to i uh, want to show you this morning how gentle god is should you come to him in real repentance and humility i will therefore use a few few illustrations maybe just two or or three uh, i want to use from the old testament as well as the new testament so that you can see and understand that god has not changed he's the same god the same God that he was in the Old Testament, he's the same in the New Testament. The same gracious, merciful, kind, loving God uh, that he was in uh, the Old Testament, he's still like that in the New Testament. Now, in the book of Samuel, Samuel chapter 11 and 12, you and I can read the story of David. David who committed two horrible things in Israel, of which both of those were punishable by death. The law required absolute death, stoning for, for these two uh, uh, terrible uh, sins. First, he committed adultery uh, with a man's wife, and then he tried to cover it up. Eventually, he arranged for the husband to be killed. And uh, I, I don't know how long uh, he kept that covered. Before the prophet Nathan came to him. In verse 7 of chapter 12. God through the prophet Nathan. And you can read that. God reminds David. Of all of the kindness that he had shown him. And then he asks him. Why he still. After all God's goodness in his life. That he went ahead. And he did this evil. And he despised the commandment of God. And maybe you too are so aware. Of God's goodness in your life. And I know many people say this to me. You know God has been so good to me. God has been so gracious to me. And yet I have failed God. And I've sinned. And I've done this thing over and over again. And I think God is tired of me. And uh, God has forsaken me. But I want you to know that it's not the case. If there is a desire in your heart. To serve God, it means that God has not given up on you. You see, God looks at the heart. God does not look uh, uh, on the outward. You know, that was the difference between David and Saul. Saul also sinned, but God rejected him. But, and the reason God rejected him is because God looked in his heart and saw that there was no real repentance. He once said, well, I am sorry I have sinned. 
But David said to Nathan, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And there was real heartfelt repentance. And I'm sure during all that time that he has covered up the sin, he lived in a literal hell because the Holy Spirit convicted him. And you cannot live in sin and uh, have the Holy Spirit convict you and not feel terrible. You cannot enjoy life. You, you cannot enjoy uh, 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 anything about life. Uh, it, it is a terrible uh, situation of, I cannot describe it better as hell on earth until you repent, until you come to the Lord. And maybe you also, you've done some things in your past and you feel guilty about that and you feel that God has been so good to me and how could I have, how could I have done this evil thing? And uh, so often people say, who said, I will never do such and such. They end up doing it, and then they feel, how, how, how is it possible? How can God forgive me? But I want you to know that God is a forgiving God. God looks for opportunity to be gracious and merciful to you. This thing might drive you and cause you to be full, as I've said, condemnation and guilt. It may keep you from prayer. It will. It will keep you from the Word of God. It will keep you from church. It will keep you from having contact with other Christians because of the guilt and the shame that this thing brings that you may have committed. But I want to encourage you today, run to God, go to God. Uh, don't overlook His mercy. Understand that He's a merciful God. I remember the word in the book of Isaiah where God says, let us reason together. Though your sins were as scarlet, they will be whiter than snow. God is willing to forgive. And David did the following. In 2 Samuel 12 verse 13, he says, And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin." You shall not die. You see, many times Satan will convince you you will die because of a certain sin. And, and it's true. If you continue in sin, the wages of sin is death. But if you come to God in repentance, he cancels death. He gives you life instead of death. Now, my friend, there's real, if there's real repentance, then God in his loving kindness and mercy looks for a way to put your sin away. Uh, scripture actually reveals that he casts it into the depths of the sea. The Bible says he removes it as far as the east are from the west. And he thinks no longer about that. God's thoughts to you after repentance has not changed. His love towards you has not changed. His plans for you have not changed. And I know, you know, many people think if you've fallen grossly, that uh, God will never use you again, even though you be restored. And I've heard uh, uh, David Wilkerson say this. He says that uh, he's heard many great preachers preach this and say of David, for example, that after his sin, he sort of, you don't hear much about David and he was like on the background. But that's not the truth. Uh, God still after that calls him a man after his own heart. And, and David continued to serve God. There were certain uh, uh, consequences that he had to suffer, natural things. But God fully restored him as king and as his man. And so I want you to know that although you may have fallen in a great way, God is able to fully restore you. And the reason I'm saying it is because the Bible says the calling and the gifting of God is without repentance. It doesn't take it away. God is looking for ways to uh, raise you up, to restore you. Remember the scripture says that the righteous may fall seven times, but each time he gets up. And I want you to get up today. I want you to rise up today. I want you to forget about your sin. I want you to understand that God is able to do much greater things through you after you've been broken. Uh, God looks for a willing heart. God looks for a repentant heart. Now, the second Example I want to use is the woman that was caught in adultery in the book of John chapter number 8. You can read there from verse 3 to 11. The Bible says 
uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders of the time, brought a woman to Jesus who was caught in the very act of adultery. That means that they walked in to that bedroom and found her worth a man. And it always amazes me that they bring the woman to Jesus and not the man. And they were both guilty. And according to the law of the time, they both had to be stoned. But what they really wanted was for Jesus to condemn the woman to death, seeing that is what the law of righteousness demands. You see, they could see from the life of Jesus and his teachings that he shows mercy, that he brought the heart of God to people. He showed people how the Father really is like. And uh, they wanted to use the law now. And force him to condemn her. But instead Jesus. And you can read the story for yourself. He was moved with compassion. The Bible doesn't specify it like that. But I can just picture it. He was, he was seeing this woman. This woman maybe dejected. Her head hanging down. Maybe torn clothing. Maybe half naked. Uh, uh, ashamed. Standing before him. Expecting to be condemned. And he looked into her heart. And he saw real sorrow, real repentance. And he extended mercy and grace to the woman. In the way he handled that whole situation, you can see how the grace and the mercy of God was manifested. And he said these liberating words to her, which I want you to hear this morning, because this is also for you. If you have fallen, if you have missed the mark, if you have sinned and you feel that, that there's only condemnation and, and, God, and you're not ready to meet uh, Jesus when he comes and, and, and Jesus will not accept you, then I want you to hear these words. Jesus say, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what he said to the woman. You see, his forgiveness is of such a nature that it enables one, it empowers one to go free of guilt and to be able to live without that sin, to overcome sin, to sin no more. That's his desire for us not to sin. He came to set his people free from their sin. And so you and I cannot be free unless we experience His mercy, unless we experience His grace. And let me tell you this morning, He's gracious and He's merciful, and He will restore you if you have a repentant heart. Uh, God knows if you come to Him and you say you are sorry and uh, you don't really have a repentant heart. But if you have a repentant heart, if you are sorrowful according to the God's requirement, if there's a godly sorrow within you, God will restore you. He will show you mercy. He will show you love. Now, I do not know what you have done, as I've said, in your life. You may have committed fornication, adultery. You may have committed murder. Uh, you may have not done it physically. Maybe in your heart you have done it. Uh, but whatever it is, maybe you've committed fraud, maybe you've stolen, maybe, maybe you've done things that you've said that you would never do. Maybe you've gone into homosexuality, maybe uh, even worse in bestiality, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, uh, I want you to know that God is able to forgive any kind of sin if you are repentant, if you are willing to come to him. He will not only forgive you. But he will restore you. Not only will he restore you. He will empower you. To live free from the sin. That you have committed. If you would come to him. You see Jesus is the only deliverer. The only savior. And uh, you and I. Who are believers. Who have sinned. Who have fallen. Who are away from God. Who are living maybe in sin. I want you to know that Jesus is calling you back to himself. He's willing to forgive and to cleanse you. Remember the Bible says if we confess our sins, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we have fellowship with Him, His blood cleanses us. And God is calling you back to fellowship with Him. Come back to Jesus. Come back home. Remember the, the prodigal son. Left the father, spent his inheritance, lived with war whores, had drunken parties, 
lost everything. And yet when he came home, the father was not only willing to receive him back, but to restore him fully. Gave him a ring, gave him a garment and had a great feast. And so Jesus is the same. God is the same today. The father is the same. And if you would only come back to him, and I'm calling every backslidden Christian this morning, come back to God. If you are in rebellion, leave the rebellion, confess it to God, get free from that and come back home. Come back to Jesus because he's willing to forgive and to be merciful to you. The, the mercy and the grace of God is so vast. We would never understand the, the vastness and the greatness thereof. But you know what? We can experience it. And I want you to dare to come to Him. How much more, if God is merciful to the ungodly, how much more does He not want to save you who already believe in Him? You who are already a child of Him. Let Him deal with you. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He wants to set you free from sin and from failure. Now, it is true that people may reject you because of your sin. It is even true that many times churches will excommunicate you because of certain things. And uh, that may be the best for the, for the body of Christ. But if there is repentance and there's a turning to God, God will restore you. And uh, I want to remind you of what happened to the Corinthian church where a man had the wife of his father and they had to excommunicate this man, cast him out of the church. But this man repented and it was real repentance. And then in Second Corinthians, he was restored back to the church. And, and so uh, I want you to even see that if this has happened to you and you've been excommunicated because of a certain sin, that if there's true repentance, God can bring you back into fellowship. And, uh, uh, you know, His forgiveness is complete. There's no condition to it. But I know that where real repentance is, God is able to restore us to the original purpose that He has for our lives. And so don't give up on the call of God on your life. If you've sinned, know that God will restore you perfectly if you will give him that chance and God is calling Christians all over the world back to him you know I've said some time ago that God uh, is busy cleaning the church and that is so but that does not mean that God will not forgive and God will not be merciful and God will not restore and so if that is you I want you to pray with me if you say I'm coming back to God uh, I, I'm really going to serve him uh, i'm sick of the sin i'm sick of living in this earthly hell because it's hell when the holy spirit convicts you and you are in living in sin uh, you can come back to him and you can experience peace and joy again in the presence of the lord if that is you i want you to pray this prayer with me make an absolute quality uh, decision and commitment consecrate your life to him and you will see what god will do in these last few hours that we have before he returns. I'm sure that you want to go with in the rapture. And so let us get ready. Let us get our families ready. Let us live right. Uh, and let us not let go of the promise of God. That if we come boldly to the throne of grace. That we will find grace and mercy. Both of that mercy and grace. And God will help us. The Holy Spirit is ready to help you out of your sin. Out of your situation. You have help from God. You have the most powerful being next to you. In you. That can help you to overcome. And so don't give up. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for your grace. Your grace is so vast. So awesome. So wonderful. And Lord. Many of us. If not all of us. At one stage in our life has misused and abused the grace of God and the mercy of God. And many of us, if not most, have felt the condemnation, the guilt, the shame. And we've given up on ourselves and we thought that maybe you have also given up on us. Because people around us gave up. But Lord, we thank you that that's not the case. That today we can understand that you are for us that you want us to come back home, that you are like that father of the prodigal son, just waiting and 
looking out for the return of the prodigals. And so, Lord, we pray that you will heal everyone that's praying now together with us. Heal their hearts. Set them free of guilt, of condemnation. Set them free, O oh God, of that sin in their lives that are causing the problems. And Lord, let it be uprooted and let it be destroyed. We pray that the sword of the Spirit of God will enter in and cut out that thing uh, once and for all. And Lord, that the oil of the anointing of your Holy Spirit will come and heal those wounds and that you will raise up your people and make them bold in these days, that they will not be sin conscious anymore, but God conscious doing that which is well pleasing in your sight. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, Amen.